The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com. Hello and welcome back to the Ben Heck Show. In a previous episode, we began work on a miniature pinball machine. The idea was to make something about one half scale and drive it with a single Teensy 3.1 Freescale based microcontroller unit. In the first episode, we built the electronics that would drive the display, sound, solenoids, and switches. In today's episode, we're going to apply all that to actually make the mechanical build. We're going to make a miniature play field, attach servos, coils, switches, etc., to it, then attach it to the logic to create a fully functional game, complete with a little miniature ball. Let's get started. Amazing hacks. How can we make this portable? Inspire designs. I am the internet troll. Regrettable acting. Bad damn hatches! Each week, Element 14's The Ben Heck Show brings you innovative projects using electronics, engineering, and more. I'm going to make this miniature pinball machine primarily with the laser cutter and the 3D printer. The laser cutter will be good for things like the play field itself, which will be a piece of six millimeter plywood. And then there'll be insert holes on the play field, as you can see there. And those will actually be holes cut in the plywood and then we'll cut matching circles with acrylic so the light will shine through them. The spacers that actually lift up the plastics will be 3D printed as will the opto mounts. Um, we're using optos because the ball is pretty light. It's not strong enough to actually push a switch. It moves around fast, but doesn't have enough mass to push a switch. Therefore, it cannot have a mass effect on the switch. Here is the plastic layer. These are going to be on the spacers. There'll be two layers of plastic, so they'll be well above the ball, keeping it in check. There are walls, and I have tabs that will slot into them. So I'll cut the walls in the laser and then slot them in place. These are basically to keep the board straight and also for the ball to roll down. The uh, load coil will go down there. This coil allows the ball to pass through like that. Let's see what else we got. This, this coil actually kicks the ball out. So what happens is this one opens up here, then this one kicks the ball out, Vroop, and the ball goes into the shooter lane. Nice. This plunger we will 3D print and we'll use Ninja Flex, so there's kind of a rubber tip. What else we got here? Flipper bats, those will be 3D printed. Ramps. We draw the ramps in two dimensions, but they'll also be 3D printed. None of these parts are very large, so they're okay for 3D printing. Here are the ramp loops. The ramps feed into the loop. The ball will do this. And then it'll go down here. And then there will be receivers at the bottom. So the ball will go here. It'll go on metal rails that we like to call habit rails. I don't know why, but they're called that. Then the ball goes down here and then it's fed to the return lane. We have to keep in mind how large the flipper actuators are. They're pretty big. So we want to make sure they don't hit any lights or anything else. And finally, there'll be a case around it. Here is the laser cut, hopefully, final play field. And I also laser cut these white acrylic inserts. Now the laser, just like a plasma cutter, has kind of a kerf to it. It doesn't cut a straight line, it cuts almost more like a V. So I'm going to actually pop these inserts in, inverted into this so the V kerf on the wood and the V kerf on the target kind of match up. And I also put some tolerance into the sizes to accommodate for that. Let's see if it works. Yeah, look at that. Hmm, maybe I don't even have to glue them, that'd be good. Okay, I'm going to insert all of these. There's basically two sizes, half inch and then three quarter inch. And then this is gonna be a cool feature that I haven't designed yet. Maybe it'll be a miniature pop bumper, I don't know. <laughs> all right, let's get these inserted. In the world of pinball politics, house of pinball cards. So these inserts indicate the ramp shots, the orbits, the uh, mode start, which will be hitting this. And then this one is like space again in case you drain. But if you drain too quickly, it feels sorry for you and gives you the ball back. Now to apply the graphics. Felix sanded this piece of wood really nicely before we put it into the laser. And now I'm using a tack cloth, which is a 
sticky cloth that you can buy at the hardware store to pick up any dust before we apply the graphics. So I've got several layers I'm gonna do in a certain sequence. This is a uh, clear enamel receptive. I'm gonna put this one on first. I'm using a cloth here because a squeegee would have too much friction. If I was wearing a long sleeve shirt, I would just use that. And we can see where some of these targets are a little depressed. You know, they're like, oh, I'm sad. So I can actually visibly see the crease in the vinyl, which tells me if I need to push them in or out. That's pretty good. All right. Now, we're going to apply a white layer. And the reason we're doing this is so that we can have some transparency in our graphics. Oh, and Felix has arrived. He could help me. Okay, now peel that off at a low angle. Now this is control tack. See how it's got a texture? That will prevent bubbles, in theory. But we still wanna do it as well as possible. Okay, lift it up, go over. Hover it above the corners until we're ready. Go a little bit more your way. Let's just use water. <laughs> okay, now we can just put it down willy-nilly, who cares? Whee! Now I have to do my water release. Today in the Ben Heck Show, vinyl application. So what I'm gonna do now is I'm gonna soak the transfer tape and that will cause the transfer tape's bond to the vinyl to be broken and it'll lift off, in theory, the power of spit on my thumb of my hand. Now to apply the CMYK graphics. These are printed on transparent, clear, so this will add the color and this will give us the white background, creating an image, in theory. No, not in theory, I know it'll work. <laughs> I'm using water so I can position it once it's in place. And I'm gonna align it to the targets, not necessarily the edges, although it's pretty accurate all, all around. I'm just gonna do a couple light passes with the squeegee. I'm doing light passes so I don't like pull or slide the vinyl. Once I get some light passes done, then I do some strong passes. I'm gonna grab my phone and we'll light up the target. Like awesome, awesome. Okay, I'm just gonna go over this a few more times, make sure it's nice and flat, and then I will go and trim everything. The graphics place applied laminate to the CMYK, so I don't have to add any more layers. This is the top layer. We have the new play field ready to rock. I'm going to move some of the parts over from our test play field onto this one. Okay, let's move these ramps first. There's still a few things in this pinball that are in a state of flux, i.e. we don't know how we're gonna do them, but we can you know, get, get as far as we can with what we have. I assembled this miniature plunger. It has three 3D printed parts. There's a Ninja Flex, flexible tip. I mean, it's pretty hard, but it's slightly different than the rest. And then there's a middle plate, which will actually attach to the case and then a black handle that you pull back and pow, it'll shoot the ball up this little ramp here. And the reason we have the little ramp is so the ball goes over it and then down into the play field. That way these orbits are kept intact. Uh, my only concern is we don't really know how hard this will hit the ball until we have everything together. It might hit it too hard and the ball will be like pow. But if that's the case, we'll put like some sort of curve up here, like a backstop to kind of guide it back down. Unfortunately, we won't really know until we build it. All right, let's continue building. I'm gonna start working on the ramps now. My idea is to use these brass rods as uh, guides. They'll stick into this cup here, like that, and then they'll attach to a curved piece up here, which comes off the ramp, see? So the ball will come down this path and be fed right into the in-lane very nicely. Then for a switch, we'll actually hook wires up to these brass rods so when the ball touches them, it'll complete the circuit and then you know you've hit the ramp. Ha ha, score. I'm gonna work on the ball path. I have this in-lane here and then we also need a tunnel that will reload the ball after you drain the ball. So what I'm doing here is laser cutting multiple stacks of the same shape to give a certain thickness. And I'm screwing this from the bottom and there'll also be a cover that screws to the top. And that's good because I don't have screws long enough to go through all four layers. So what I do next 
Now that that's in place, I'm gonna use some glue, good old super glue. Then I'm gonna stack these layers, keeping them as level as I can. So what I'm gonna do here is make a ball um, release, so to speak. There's going to be a solenoid here with this special cap that I printed. And what it's gonna do is it's gonna prevent the ball from coming out. So when the game is over, you can't get the ball out. So what happens is um, this will open and there'll be a kicker. So when it's ready to give you a ball, this will open and this will kick the ball over. So I'm gonna get this guide installed first, then I'll get this solenoid installed, and then I'll work on the kicker and the thing that actually detects if the ball has drained. The power of garbage in the palm of my hand. Oh, I hope the ball still rolls up there without hitting this lip. That's something I didn't really account for. I'm just gonna have to hope and pray that it works. <laughs> I mean, <clears throat> I have no doubt it will work. Look, I, I wasn't worried. <laughs> Now we need to think about the orbits. I've got these plastic pieces here and they're gonna be a little higher than the other plastic pieces because I'm gonna try to put optos under them. Use a IR emitter detector. Not doing it at, you know, 38 kilohertz is just a straight IR beam. And what'll happen in, well, hopefully what'll happen is when the ball rolls around, it'll break the beam and then we'll know that we made an orbit loop. And by timing it, if we see this beam and then this beam broken in a certain space to each other, we know which way the ball is traveling. And that'll probably be the extent of the code I'll be able to make for this game. So I've got these, uh, this is a detector. I actually put a little bit of thought into this, like which way there'll be more specular light and stuff. Oh look, there's already a hole there. I could just use that. It's a little too small though. Okay, I'm gonna get this mounted in place. I have to drill a new hole for it though. The power of a drill in the palm of my hand. It was drilling, wasn't it? And I 3D printed this little shroud for the detector so that it's isolated. It makes it very directional. I'm just gonna glue this in place. Yeah, that'll be fine. Well, not like I have to tell anyone that 3D printers are handy, but 3D printers are really handy. Because in this case, I was able to just make all these custom spacer lengths. Like most of the spacers on this were 0.2, but these are 0.3 inches high. So yeah, super handy. So these are the same height as the Opto, so the plastic will just sit. And I actually took into account the fact that if this is 0.1 inch higher, the ball touches it at a different spot. So there's actually, it's actually compensated so the transition from the lower plastic to the higher plastic should be smooth in theory, although it's probably not super critical. But I did it anyway. And the second layer of plastic has a cutout in it because it needs a space for that loop. Okay, one thing I'm kind of curious about is how much force this little shooter rod's gonna have. I'm just worried it's gonna have too much force. Let's test it out. Well, that works out pretty well. Obviously, I designed it that way. This is a solenoid kicker mech that I designed. The solenoid pulls in the rod, causing this to kick over. And I wanna use this to unload the drain. So I'm gonna mount this down here in this slot. And when the ball drains, it'll go right here. And now to detect the drain, I'm gonna put an opto underneath, pointing up through the slot. And then there'll be a opto pair looking down at it. So when the ball breaks that beam, we know that the ball drained. And then to load another ball, this solenoid here is to keep it from getting out. But what'll happen is this will release and this will snap over and then the ball will load. So I'm gonna get this installed. <laughs> Possum Park sounds like a terrible idea. Now it's time for a tech timeout. We've been using a lot of shift registers in this project, so I thought I would talk about them. Now, shift register is an integrated circuit that allows you to clock data in or out serially and then hit a latch line to make it appear or be inputted into itself in parallel. This is an example of how we did the solenoid control on our project. We didn't have a ton of I.O. because a lot of it was used up by the audio, so we had to conserve it. And we did that by using shift registers. We have just three lines, data, clock, and latch. And the clock and latch we used over all our devices, actually. Every time you pulse clock, 
whatever is on the data pin will go into the shift register and get shifted down the line. And it'll also get shifted out to the next shift register. So you can put them in series, basically as many as you want. When you pulse the latch line, the data that you've shifted in will appear on the actual outputs. So you can control when it changes. It doesn't change here like a Johnson counter might. It changes all at once when you hit latch, which is good because then this is you know consistent. So yeah, if you need more IO than you have in a project, consider a shift register. Now we're going to install the flipper assemblies. We've already experimented with this in the previous episode, but now we're gonna finish it. So the method I've come up with is to screw into this flipper with super glue around it so it will never move again. Now this is the flipper actuator. I did, oh, I don't know, six different revisions of it before I got it the way I wanted but I think we have it dialed in. So this is just like a real flipper where there's a soft rubbery ring thing. I printed this with Ninja Flex and it goes over it. So there's different durometers to it. Okay, so what we're gonna do is we're gonna put the flipper in place at the right angle and then kind of rotate this onto it. So I'm gonna take this piece of wood That'll hold the flipper bat where it needs to be. The key to making these flipper actuators work were ball bearings. I'm gonna put this onto the screw shaft and there's a captive nut in there too. So I'm gonna thread it onto the nut. So the ball bearings will give us very low resistance against the wood. I mean, if this was metal underneath, it would be a little bit smoother, but we've done some tests. The ball bearings actually work pretty well. And I wanna uh, twist this on until the ball bearings are just about to the wood and that this shaft is over to the left. That way we have enough room for the flipper actuator. So now the trick is to find the right place to put this and we're just gonna slap it in there willy nilly and just hot glue it, I won't lie. So what I'm gonna do before we start is make sure the flippers, oh, I hate wires. <laughs> the flipper is where we want it. And then I'm gonna make some marks on this so we know where it's supposed to go. Okay. All right, now we can remove this. So we want to um, position this in such a place that it you know, pulls it quickly and has a lot of slop, basically. The hole in the actuator is a little larger than the screw, which is good because that gives us slop when we rotate. So what I wanna basically do is find the angle of least, basically of least friction. So we have a, the linear motion can be translated well into a rotational motion. The park is open. <laughs> I wanna make sure these screws have a little bit of slop I can't put on a lock nut because I can't get it to screw at the bottom. So I'm just going to hold one nut and then clamp the other one onto it to make a press fit there. Okay, we're gonna test it and if it works, we'll hot glue it so it'll be super secure. And then also put some super glue on the shaft of the flipper so it will never move again. Let's quickly test the two flippers before we bolt anything else in place. Got this 12 volt power supply. Ooh, all right, here we go. Nope, try to do a post pass. No, I can't. Oh yeah, look at that. Okay, it clearly works. I'm gonna glue this in place for anything else happens. I soldered the constant current light drivers together with a common clock and latch. And there's two datas going into this. So these are loaded in parallel. Uh, I'm just going to glue these on the bottom just so they're out of the way of other things. And then we'll manually wire from these to all of our LED elements. We have plugs and everything, so everything will come apart basically in one piece. So you can remove the play field completely from the cabinet. So we have power and data going to the lights, and then we'll extend the lights out from here to the other parts of the play field. I've been 3D printing these little brackets that we can put these six millimeter LEDs into, and then we'll just glue these in place over each light. And I've marked the polarity with a black band just to help keep track. 
I am gluing these light fixtures in place behind the inserts. I'm just using up a bunch of six millimeter LEDs that we had laying around. Some are brighter than others, so I'm actually going to put the brighter ones on the upper lights and the dimmer ones on the lower lights, just so they're consistently inconsistent. My favorite thing on earth. Let's try lighting one up. Okay, ready? Pew, pew. Does it look good? I can't see it from here. It does. Oh, good, yeah. all right. I'm gonna hook up the constant current LED driver to all of our insert lights, as well as the general illumination. The constant current LED driver that I'm using sinks the LEDs to ground in order to activate them. So I'm running a positive five volt rail to all the LEDs first. Then each LED's negative will go back to the constant current driver to actually turn it on. I'm making sure that I keep the LEDs low and tight against the play field so I have room for anything else I might need to add later on. Always assume you don't have room, then if you run out of room, you've got room. I got all the LEDs hooked up to the constant current driver and they're all blinking. We have some of them strobing, some of them just blinking. So yeah, should look pretty decent. So now I have to do the solenoids and switches. I'm now going to attach wires to the solenoids so they can reach our driver board, which will be in the base of the unit, even when it's open. So I have to not just think about the distance when it's actually all together, but the distance when it's opened. I know I say that a lot, but it's really important to think about. I have the play field tipped up like this because I want to know the lengths of the wires when the unit is fully assembled, but opened up. Always make things you can take apart. So I basically am simulating what the final cabinet shape will be like to make sure all the wires are the correct length. I want them to be as long as they need to be, but as short as possible. Okay, I believe I have all of the switches hooked up for this mini pinball machine. There's a right orbit. So you can see on the screen, the bit changes there. Left orbit, bit changes. And there's an opto down here, which is when the ball drains. And then the two ramps, which just complete a circuit. Yeah. That's a little sketchy, but if we have a debounce and a timer, it'll work fine. So basically the first time it sees it, it won't re-trigger for two seconds or however long it takes the ball to roll around. Okay, this opto here is kind of in the apron. So we'll just put like a uh, logo plate or something to cover it up. There's just the best place I could put it where it wouldn't hit the kick out lever. So all the switches are in place, all the lights are in place, all the solenoids are in place. I can finally give it some code to make it come to life. When we made the play field, we still weren't sure what was going to go in this little cutout circle. I just cut out the circle because we had to get the play field done even before we had all the mechs finished. That's how life goes. So a couple of days ago, Felix and I were talking about what could go in that spot, like some, something that the ball could hit at least. And what was your idea? Yeah, I was looking at the uh, space shuttle game and it had this drop target. I said, hey, let's make that. So a drop target in a pinball is um, something that stays up and then when you hit it with the ball, it goes down and then hits a switch. And the trick is you have to be able to reset it somehow. So I made a deal with Felix, but then Felix realized he's making a deal with the devil. <laughs> the deal was I would figure out, I would make the mechanical 3D printed part for the drop target if he would figure out how to make the actuator to put it back up. And he did. So tell us how you did it, Felix. Uh, I put a motor on there with a little lever, and then it's a gear motor, so I made an H-bridge so that, and I also added some logic to it, so that you can push a button or send a signal, and it'll go up, send another signal, it'll put the lever back down, and then that resets the target so that it can go down again. Let's take a closer look at the mech. There's a ring plate that fits into the wood and is flush with the surface. Then a target slide frame that goes into that, and the target fits in that. So the target slides up and down, and there's a spring on it, and there's a little lip on the edge of the target. So when the target is pushed up, the lip holds onto the edge of the flange, and the spring actually kind of pulls the lip against the flange like this, so the spring is in front of it. But then when you hit it, it goes back and down, like that. So then what Felix added was this motor mech. And can you explain that to us? Yeah. The challenge was to add the actuation and then a switch to find out when the target is down. Mm -hmm. So I was originally gonna do some foam core stuff, but I just went some, with some plastic. And I dug up this gear motor that we had, hooked that on there, 
And the gear motor, it kind of goes wildly, so I needed to control it. So I put a metal bar on the top and metal bar on the bottom, and I also added some wires so that we can sense when the motor is Oh, so you're limits. using a lever to complete a circuit. Mm-hmm. Okay. Up, down. I've automated the drop target. Basically, it will wait to see if the drop target is down. Then if it is, it will put it back up. And it's using an H bridge, which I have attached to the main circuit board. In the normal game, it will, uh, you know, stay down for a while until you do something else. But I'm just having it pop back up after a second. There we go. Fun! I've completed the case for the miniature space shuttle. It has custom graphics on the side, black trim, a piece of plastic to hold everything in, and there's spacers too, and a handle, so um, even if the ball is like rolling around, it can't, it can't go anywhere that it's not supposed to. The speakers are up front here by the handle. It's a start button, plunger, volume, obviously the flipper buttons. Let's give it a try. Sweet, thousand points. Ah! I may eventually put an RGB LED behind the drop target to kind of light the whole thing up. Since it's clear printed material, it should light up pretty well. That's one of the reasons I used a lot of clear on this because I knew the colors would come through like the blues and stuff. Let's try it again. Whoa! Combo! Oh, look, I knocked some hot glue loose. <laughs> Spend some hot glue left over. I'm gonna tilt the machine. <laughs> See, ideally, I would use like a lead ball to make the weight scale better, but you know, that'd probably be frowned upon. Oh! Wow, this thing sucks quarters. Oh, I should, no, instead of a quarter slot, it should have had a dime slot because of the scale. No, we don't have time to do that. <laughs> the challenge for this two-part project was to make something cool using a Freescale Semiconductor product. We decided to use the Teensy 3.1 as the base, as it had quite a bit of documentation available. The result is a portable miniature pinball machine, complete with lights and sound. Putting it together was a lot of work, but I'm very happy with the results. It's fun to play, too. Things I would have done differently? Well, I wish we had a better solution for the flipper bats. They work, but they took a lot of effort, and they're still not perfect. Also, if we would have taken the time to find some low-force micro switches, we might not have had to use as many opto interrupters as we did. That little ball just doesn't have enough mass to push heavy switches. The optos work, but they required extra wiring. What would you have done differently for this project? Have you ever made a miniature version of something large before? Let us know on the Element 14 community, where you can also keep track of our upcoming episodes, builds, and special events. We'll see you next time. Oh, man. We should just have a montage of the ball falling on the floor. That. Welcome to Possum Park. Pinball wizard has to be a... Why? <laughs> I discovered the Infinity Stone in 2000, no wait, no, 1932. Kick it. <laughs> Spock, how do we defeat Khan? I've promised never to tell you about the future. Here is how to beat him. Jim Henson's Muppet Baby Pinball. It's got dead eyes like a doll's eyes. <laughs> That's why you should only use CFC free hairspray when I get ready for the club. <laughs> hey, baby, I'm so healthy. <laughs> <laughs> awesome possum in the club. The Ben Heck Show is brought to you by Element 14, the electronic design community where you can connect and collaborate with top engineers from around the world. Join now at element14.com.